My name is Tracy Young. I'm MSNA, MBA, CRNA. This virtual session will be about ketamine clinics from inception to infusion. I have a disclosure that I'd like to uh, make everyone aware of. I am the founder of NeuroMend Infusion Center, which is a ketamine infusion center in Lafayette, Louisiana, since 2017. And um, during this presentation also, I will be discussing some off-label use of drugs, specifically ketamine. Some of the objectives for today during this virtual session, we're going to look at the history of ketamine. We're going to talk about some of the pharmacokinetics of ketamine. And then we're going to get into a lot of the alternative uses for ketamine, such as for treatment-resistant depression, uh, complex regional pain syndrome, migraines, and some other uses of ketamine that are outside of the normal anesthesia use for ketamine. In preparing this lecture today, I was studying on the history of ketamine and reading up on it, and a quote from Lord Bryan came to mind, which says, "'Tis strange but true, for truth is always strange, stranger than fiction." And in learning about the early history of ketamine and some of the uses and, and some of the abuses of ketamine, I think we'll find that a pretty applicable uh, quote for what we're going to see here in the future. So ketamine is a fencyclidine, a derivative. Fencyclidine is also known as PCP. It is classified as an anesthetic and is a Schedule III drug in the United States. Depending on dosage, ketamine produces a trance-like state, pain relief, sedation, and memory loss, and it is also widely used in veterinary medicine as well. This is the chemical compound of ketamine. Uh, the ketamine nurse at my clinic, the infusion nurse, actually has this as a tattoo uh, on his arm. So if you ever see someone with a tattoo like this, he is my ketamine nurse. There may be others as well that has it. So the history of ketamine. Ketamine was first synthesized in 1962 by an American scientist named Calvin Stevens. He was looking for a drug that would replace PCP, which actually came out in 1926. PCP actually had some fairly good properties related to anesthesia because it really numbed all the senses and was a really good pain reliever. However, it caused severe hallucinations and psychotic symptoms. So uh, Dr. Stevens was trying to find an alternative that still produced the positive effects of encyclidine, but didn't have the negative side effects of the hallucinations and psychotic symptoms. So in 1963 was the first use of ketamine. It was used in a veterinary anesthetic in Belgium. The first human use was the next year in 1964, and it was pretty successful. It did have less hallucinogenic uh, side effects than PCP. And then the first known uh, recreational use of ketamine was in 1965 by noted professor Edward Domino, who noted that the potential psychedelic effects um, of ketamine was rather potent, and he actually coined the term that we use today in that ketamine is a disassociative anesthetic. And the story goes that um, he was using ketamine uh, on himself, trying to understand the effects and what ketamine felt like so that he can um, further um, understand how it worked. And when he finished a ketamine trip, he asked his wife, um, so what was I like? You know, and she said, well, it's like you were disconnected from your environment, was how she uh, described it to him. And he's like, well, that's not a very scientific term. So he said, how about a disassociative anesthetic? And the term stuck, and it's what we still use today over, what is that, 60 years later. There's also a great article called Taming the Ketamine Tiger that's in the 2010 Journal uh, of Anesthesiology from the American Society of Anesthesiologists. It talks a lot about the early days of ketamine use, um, how it was developed, why it was developed, and in some of the um, early recreational use as well. And one of the stories that really fits the Lord Byron quote from earlier involved Marcia Moore. She was a yoga instructor in California and they went to a ketamine, she went to a ketamine party and met Dr. Howard Altoonan. And during this ketamine party, everyone self-administered ketamine back then and, um, and in these parties. And she and Dr. Altoonan fell madly in love with each other and actually got married two weeks after their first ketamine trip together. What makes this story interesting and even more weird is that Marcia Moore 
continued using ketamine daily. And her purpose was to achieve some form of higher cognitive state through the use of ketamine and by taming the ketamine tiger. And what we'll find out later is that ketamine use, uh, you build up a tolerance pretty rapidly. So she kept having to use higher and higher dosages to get some of the same effects in order to, for, for her to try and achieve this higher cognitive state that she was working on. And the story goes that she disappeared one day and no one found her for several months until the remains of her body was found on a mountain in California. And the thought is, is that she went off and uh, had a ketamine trip and actually froze to death on the side of a mountain. So um, really, really strange history of ketamine. It is not recommended for um, recreational consumption um, for numerous reasons. Here's an image from the 1970s uh, from that article, Taming the Ketamine Tiger, uh, in which in the foreground, we see the chemical compound of ketamine and we see the active metabolite in the background uh, with the tiger kind of coming out of a warm, a warm hole there. So ketamine is addictive. Uh, it does have street names. It can be used um, recreational. Uh, since it is a Schedule Three drug, it is, is highly illegal to do so. Some of the street names are Special K, Kit Kat, Cat Volume, uh, Vitamin K. Um, ketamine has a relatively short-lived time and tolerance can be built up relatively quickly. We actually see this in some of our ketamine infusion patients where the same dose, uh, they're not getting the same effect. So within a matter of a week, quite often we'll have to tailor, tailor the doses up to get the same effect. Uh, ketamine is produced as a liquid, uh, which can be injected. And it's also produced as a white or off-white powder, uh, which can be snorted by abusers or put into pill form. We'll see that the PO, um, bioavailability of ketamine is very low. It's only about 20% after the first pass effect. So in a study uh, looking at the abuse of ketamine, uh, it's been found that um, the use of ketamine is often, and the abuse of ketamine is often, often done by relatively young individuals in our society. So ER admissions that ages 12 to 25 accounted for over 74% of the ketamine emergency visits from uh, recreational use. And also, a uh, University of Michigan study found that 3% of high school uh, students had used ketamine at some point uh, during their high school career. So 3% doesn't sound like a lot, but we know in anesthesia that ketamine is a pretty potent drug. Um, and it's really scary to think of high school students using ketamine on their own. How does ketamine work and what makes ketamine unique? For the past 40 years, scientists have been really trying to find drugs that have a high degree of specificity and affinity um, where these compounds interact with targeted receptors and they have a high degree of binding to these target receptors. This produces clean drugs that gives a consistent mechanism of action with very limited adverse reactions and side effects. Ketamine is basically the opposite of what we would consider a clean drug. And ketamine was invented over 60 years ago, so we'll keep that in mind. So some of the mechanisms of actions of ketamine. We know it as an MMDA competitive antagonist. That's the way we think of it in anesthesia but we also see that it reacts with tons of different neurotransmitters and tons of different receptors as well. It's also a, a weak agonist of opioid receptors, so we know that's part of the reason why we see pain relief with ketamine as well. It is an agonist of dopamine receptor as well. Uh, plus, when we give ketamine and anesthesia, we see that we typically get an increased heart rate, uh, sometimes an elevation in blood pressure, which is usually the opposite of all other anesthetic drugs that we administer normally. And that's due to the inhibition of the reuptake of serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. So ketamine allows these catecholamines to continue to circulate throughout um, our body system, causing this increase in heart rate and increase in blood pressure that we see. Ketamine also works on the nitric oxide synthase system, which is also responsible for blocking pain uh, sensation as well. And what we're gonna talk about a little later is the activation of AMPA receptors. This is producing a glutamate surge and is thought to be the primary reason that ketamine works so well as an antidepressant. So scientists think that 
that they have isolated a series of reactions that produce ketamine's rapid relief of refractory uh, depression in the majority of test subjects. The AMPA receptors, as part of a glutamate receptor complex, is now thought to be the mechanism of action that relieves severe refractory depression. In this slide, we'll look at a series of reactions that happen from the MM NMDA receptor antagonism from ketamine and all these neuromodulator compounds with the end result of glutamate surge um, in the postsynaptic cleft. And when ketamine produces a rapid um, response from an antidepressant standpoint, it's thought to be due to this glutamate surge. But what's happening also, and the reason why ketamine works oftentimes for up to months after the infusion, is that the glutamate surge and through these series of reactions and through multiple doses of ketamine, there's actually a transformational shape change in the postsynaptic cleft, which makes the receptors um, more responsive to glutamate in the future. And that's why with ketamine, the half-life is relatively short. However, the effects, the antidepressant effects can actually go on for much, much longer after the infusion. In some patients, we're seeing one to three to sometimes six months of antidepressant effects after a series of ketamine infusion. And the reason being is that the shape of the neurotransmitters are changing and becoming more receptive to glutamate in the future. This slide um, really explains that in a lot greater detail that you can read at your leisure if you like. Glutamate surge is the primary thought of most of the scientists as to why ketamine uh, is so effective as an antidepressant, especially in patients that have tried multiple other modalities and drugs for antidepressant that has not worked. However, there's an alternative thought from 2018, a uh, scientist in China, they discovered that the lateral habanula acts as the dark twin of the pleasure centers of the brain. So in other words, the pleasure centers of the brain, when they're active, we tend to be happy, we tend to not be depressed, we tend to be active. When the lateral habanula is overactive, that's when depression seems to kick in, we become um, uh, less um, interactive with people, uh, we, we tend to perceive less joy in the environment <clears throat> when the lateral habanula is overreactive. So they studied in a rat simulation, uh, injections of ketamine into the rats has shown to depress the output of the lateral habanula. Thus, they think that the ketamine in depressing the lateral habanula may be another mechanism of action um, which caused the antidepressant effects through ketamine. So ketamine effects on the central nervous system. Through the NMDAR antagonism, it's responsible for the anesthetic, amnestic, disassociative, and hallucinogenic effects of ketamine that we see in anesthesia. Typically, these, um, these side effects are dose-dependent, and these, um, these reactions are dose-dependent. And what we've seen very commonly is, is through the low doses that we're giving through infusion centers and outpatient ketamine treatment, is that we're not really seeing much hallucinogenic effects, if any, uh, minimal anesthetic effects as well. And we do see some mild disassociation, but we're not really seeing any amnesia as well with the doses that we're giving in ketamine clinics. This antagonism is also responsible for some of the analgesic properties of ketamine. Um, ketamine also inhibits the synthesis of nitric oxide synthase, which lowers the production of nitric oxide, which is a neurotransmitter that's involved in pain perception. We mentioned on the early, earlier slide, there's multiple mechanisms of actions of ketamine, all reducing pain sensation. And this is another one as well, along with the opioid and mu receptors, which are relatively weak properties, the opioid portion. So on the peripheral nervous system, one of the major effects that we, we typically see, and one of the reasons why ketamine is um, very useful in anesthesia is that on the cardiovascular system, we often see an increase in blood pressure, increase in heart rate, and an increase in cardiac output. And as anesthesia professionals, we understand that almost everything else we give in the anesthesia world 
has the adverse effect um, or the opposite effect of ketamine, the decreased blood pressure, decreased heart rate, and decreased cardiac output. So when I trained nearly 20 years ago, ketamine was pretty much only used in certain situations, such as um, trauma patients that couldn't tolerate other types of anesthetics, um, and very, very narrow use of ketamine. And the doses we were given were much, much higher back then as well. Now we're given much smaller doses and uh, seeing much different effects and uses of ketamine. So some of the GI effects are related to the serotonin reuptake inhibition, uh, which is thought to cause some of the nausea and vomiting that's seen in higher doses. In our ketamine infusion patients, we're not seeing a lot of nausea and vomiting in general. Um, maybe one out of 10 patients, uh, if they come in with a history of nausea and vomiting through anesthesia in the past, we usually pre-treat them with Zofran. And what we've been finding lately is that Zofran has not been very effective in, um, in treating patients that still get nauseous and, um, and start bonding with ketamine. But we don't see it often. What we found is um, scopolamine patches tend to work very well in this patient population as well. So keep that in mind. Um, another noted effect of ketamine is that there's a lack of respiratory depression. Um, and we also get some bronchodilator effects of ketamine as well. And that's due to the increase in the catecholamine elevation. So ketamine in itself is a very, very safe drug. Uh, it does have some rather potentially nasty side effects, but due to the fact that it doesn't cause respiratory depression, it doesn't suppress uh, blood pressure and heart rate, makes it a relatively safe drug that we can give in an outpatient setting. So some of the pharmacokinetics of ketamine. Ketamine is absorbable IV, IM, orally and topically, uh, due to its high water uh, and lipid solubility. It's commercially prepared in the IV, IM, and intranasal use. It is less commonly used orally due to only around 20% uh, bioavailability due to first pass effect. The peak plasma concentrations of ketamine are reached in one minute IV, five to 15 minutes after IM administration, and 30 minutes after PO administration. The majority of the ketamine we're given on an outpatient basis is typically IV. We occasionally have some patients that come in for uh, IM boosters. They'll come in, get one IM dose. Uh, we'll monitor them for an hour or so. Um, usually when we do that, it's usually at the patient's request. Uh, sometimes it's they don't like the IV stick, they'd rather one um, IM injection. And sometimes it's due to cost. And we'll talk about some of the uh, financial implications of ketamine and um, how a ketamine business is run later. But in general, uh, a quick IM injection is a little cheaper. So we can provide those patients a cash discount to come in. So we don't have to have an IV tubing, um, IV start. Uh, just makes it a little easier and cheaper for them to continue to get the medication that they need in order to um, continue with their high degree of. Um, of functioning in society. And I, I guess now would be a good time to kind of mention, um, since we're talking about patients and, and, and how this works. So a ketamine infusion center for me has been one of the most rewarding aspects of my career in over 20 years. And I say that because in anesthesia, it's rewarding. We relieve patients' pain, we make them comfortable, they can tolerate highly invasive surgical procedures. However, they're asleep, they're anesthetic, they don't really remember us. Um, it's more internally rewarding. And what we see in the ketamine clinic is we're changing people's lives. And they come in severely depressed, um, oftentimes not leaving their home for weeks at a time. A loved one brings them in. Uh, after we screen them, they start getting ketamine infusions for depression. And all of a sudden, their outlook changes, their mood changes. They start um, getting out again. They start going to have dinner again. They start interacting more with family and friends. And we literally had hundreds of patients hugging us and crying at the end of um, ketamine infusion series after six weeks, uh, after six infusions and then a couple of weeks of infusions, saying, I have my life back now. Um, or this is, or a family member saying, you know, this is the woman I married 20 years ago, or, or I'm so glad that my mom is now back to being my old, you know, my mom that she was in the past. And thank you for this. And it's much different type of, um, of 
treatment than you would see in anesthesia. It's much more rewarding and, and changing people's lives. It's, it's really amazing. So kind of got off on a tangent on this slide, but to finish it up, intranasal administration is also associated with the rapid onset, and it does have an increased bioavailability over PO dose of ketamine. Um, currently, there is now an FDA approved um, isomer of ketamine called s -ketamine, and it's uh, marketed through Johnson & Johnson through their Janssen arm called Sporvato, and it is intranasal administration of ketamine. We'll talk about that a little bit um, in some future slides, but it is FDA approved. And since it's FDA approved, commercial insurances and Medicare are now paying for this, um, for this modality. So uh, where ketamine is still considered off-label use and experimental for, for depression and pain, most insurance companies aren't paying for it. So the patients have to pay out of pocket um, cash for, for the infusions. But now with Sporvato, um, they're able to get insurance coverage for S-ketamine, which is an intranasal administration of ketamine. Pharmacokinetics of ketamine, the biological half-life is two and a half to three hours. Its duration of action is about less than one hour after IV administration and up to two hours after IM administration. So what we typically do is we monitor our patients post-infusion for a minimum of at least 30 minutes after the infusion is complete, but oftentimes up to an hour to make sure that they're um, they're back to having all their facilities, they're not dizzy, lightheaded, not disassociating, or having any of those um, potential side effects before they leave and go home with a family member. Ketamine is metabolized primarily by the liver. It has several active, less potent metabolites as well as it gets broken down, and it is excreted 90% by the kidneys. Despite ketamine being a dirty, nonspecific drug, it is, has an extremely wide margin of safety. It has several instances of unintentional administration of overdoses up to 10 times the normal dose that's required, and they've all, been, um, they've all had full recovery after such a high accidental overdose. Uh, the World Health Organization has actually labeled ketamine one of the essential drugs for mankind. Um, one, because of its safety profile. Two, um, because it could be used in austere environments very safely as well, such as um, think about war-torn areas. Uh, ketamine is a really good anesthetic for in these austere environments. Very safe, works very well. Um, ketamine has been studied many, many times in over 12,000 operative and diagnostic procedures. It's involved over 10,000 patients in over 105 separate studies. So it's it's been well looked at, well studied, and it's found to be very effective. We tend to rate our anesthesia sometimes. Uh, we're a little harder on ourselves. We think you know, sometimes when we're struggling through an anesthetic, we think we didn't do that good of a job. But in looking at a meta-analysis of ketamine and anesthesia, we actually see that uh, the anesthesia provider and the surgeon both rated it to be a very effective anesthetic, but the surgeons, uh, oftentimes thought that our anesthetics were actually better than we did. So I think that's an interesting uh, component of this slide. So the future of ketamine and the off-label use of ketamine. Right now in anesthesia, when I first started um, our ketamine clinic in around 2017, people were just starting to use ketamine again in anesthesia. It's kind of having a bit of a resurgence or a renaissance, if you will, with micro-dosing and low-dosing of ketamine through anesthetics. Probably during most of the early 2000s to maybe 2015, ketamine stopped being used pretty commonly. And the doses that we were given prior to that time were much higher, and we were seeing a lot more of the nasty side effects. And then individuals started low dosing ketamine, 20 milligrams, 40 milligrams, 50 milligrams during anesthesia, and they started seeing their patients waking up much more comfortable, um, much happier. Uh, PACU is much happier, and um, it's working really, really well in low dose, and it's being used very, very frequently. In 2017, I did a, uh, a poll of individuals. It was non-scientific, um, but most people were using ketamine maybe once every three months. I repeated it in 2019, and the vast majority of the individuals in the audience at that time when I took the poll said they were using ketamine at least once a week. So its use is picking up and becoming much more common. Um, so we're gonna talk about some of the non-anesthetic uses of ketamine for the rest, ketamine for the rest of this lecture. 
ketamine not, is not really a panacea. It doesn't cure everything in mental health, but it is very promising. And I say that because we're seeing up to 85% effectiveness in treating and relieving depression symptoms um, in patients who have tried multiple other uh, more common forms of uh, depression treatment. <clears throat> so these are patients that have failed all other modalities, uh, drugs, SSRIs, et cetera. And we're seeing about 85% of them uh, success rate after being treated with ketamine. Ketamine is also uh, being treated for suicidal ideations, drug dependence and abuse, PTSD, and uh, complex regional pain syndrome as well. It is not a cure-all. I don't want people to think that that's what we're selling here today. However, there's a lot of positive benefits to, uh, to ketamine infusions. So ketamine for depression. Depression is the third leading cause of disability in the world today. Depression symptoms uh, can be reduced uh, very rapidly after ketamine administration and can last up to several weeks to several months as well. And these are in patients that have not seen any results from other antidepressant modalities. There's multiple small, st small studies have shown to have immediate profound alleviation of depression symptoms in up to 75% of patients that have been refractory to conventional antidepressant results. Currently, a meta-analysis um, just came out in the last year, which started aggregating all of these small studies and looking at them. And basically, um, all of the studies have shown similar results. Ketamine has been very, very effective. And some of the uh, weaknesses, though, in these studies is that they're not looking at long-term repeated use of ketamine and how well is it lasting for years, as opposed to just looking at it for several weeks or several months. So that's a bit of a weakness. We need more studies looking at the long-term effects of ketamine for anti-depression. What we're seeing in our clinic is we do a series, or we recommend a series of six infusions over an initial two-week period. Each infusion lasts one hour, and we typically see roughly one in 10 to sometimes two in 10 patients immediately feel better after the first infusion. However, we're usually seeing about 80% of our patients feel better after the third, fourth, and fifth infusion. So sometimes they get an immediate effect, and sometimes it takes the three or four or five infusions after that. As far as the length of antidepressant effects, we have many patients that come once a month for booster infusions, and then we have patients that come back sometimes maybe only once every six months when they feel like they need a booster. So the duration of the antidepressant effects varies by patient to patient, uh, but on average we're seeing four to eight weeks of antidepressant effects after the initial six infusions. When they do come back for a booster, it's usually one infusion, and it's usually only one infusion per month is what we typically allow in our protocol. So we don't have patients coming back every week. Um, we just kind of set that up as uh, something as a protection for us, that we're not getting patients just continually coming in, building up a tolerance, and getting ketamine all the time. Typically, again, six infusions over a two-week period, usually Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then the following Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, low and slow infusions of a half of a milligram to upwards of one milligram per kilogram per hour is what we're typically doing. And um, we monitor the patients for 30 minutes to an hour post-infusion, then they're allowed to go home with a family member uh, or a caretaker at that point. <clears throat> and most of the effects are lasting again for four to eight weeks in most of our patients for depression. And looking at a meta-analysis and um, this one came out in 2016, nine um, studies with 368 patients. They found very similar results to what we're seeing in our practice, which is that ketamine uh, yields a good efficacy in the rapid treatment of MDD. MDD is a major mood disorder. Um, TRD is another acronym that uh, you may hear me use frequently today. TRD stands for treatment resistant depression. Um, however, in this study, they said future large-scale clinical studies are needed to confirm the results and investigate the mid to long-term efficacy of treating with ketamine for depression. Ketamine for PTSD is also pretty common out there. <clears throat> 
my patient population um, in our area, our demographics has relatively low um, veteran population, but there are some ketamine clinics, uh, one specifically in the San Antonio area where there's a large um, military and ex-military, uh, retired military population. Uh, they're treating up to 2,000 PTSD patients a year in this ketamine clinic and uh, seeing great results uh, in treating those patients as well. We do see some PTSD patients that we treat periodically. Usually it's due to some type of family trauma um, and we're seeing pretty good results um, with ketamine as well for, for PTSD. Uh, 2014 study, uh, researchers who led by Dr. Feeder found that intravenous infusion ketamine of a half of a milligram per kilogram was associated with a significant and rapid reduction in PTSD symptoms compared to an active control agent. Uh, the study was small, it's considered proof of concept. However, we're now seeing anecdotally, like I said, up to thousands of infusions uh, per year for PTSD with really good results. Part of the reason why uh, ketamine and PTSD was looked at um, to begin with is there was a, a Yale study of uh, war veterans returning back from the first Iraq war and they looked at uh, um, soldiers who were injured in the field and they broke them up into soldiers who were primarily treated with ketamine and those who are primarily treated with um, uh, benzodiazepines and opiates in the field and what they found was that the returning soldiers that were treated with ketamine in the field had much lower incidences of PTSD after their injuries than the uh, returning soldiers who were treated with benzodiazepines and, um, and opioids. So that was kind of the feeder into, hey, can ket ketamine be used to treat PTSD as well? Something that's new that's happening is that uh, in the emergency departments, emergency room physicians are starting to treat patients uh, that come in with attempted suicide and suicidal ideations with ketamine as well. Uh, four studies from the National Institute of Mental Health that were reviewed found that a decrease in suicidal ideation um, happened very quickly and rapidly, but it was independent of improvements in mood. What that means is that the patients weren't reporting that they felt better, they were just reporting that they were having less suicidal ideations. So in the emergency department, when ketamine is used in this manner, it's really used as an aid to help patients to enter into a long-term conventional treatment regimens um, when they were having suicidal ideations. I have a couple of the emergency department friends and I asked them, and this is becoming much more prominent in their literature and becoming much um, more commonly used in the emergency departments as well. So ketamine is also used to treat migraines. Uh, it's been looked at uh, through several different studies, and we have a handful of patients that come in as well for migraine treatments with ketamine. And not surprisingly, ketamine reduces the pain associated with a migraine when patients are having migraines, right? Well, um, the studies have proved this. They show that a small dose of ketamine, either administered by professionals or administered at home, reduces the amount of pain uh, uh, perception. Um, on average, the pain score for migraines reduced from six to two and a half in one of the studies that, that was done. What wasn't looked at with ketamine for migraines was um, how frequently the migraines continue to happen, whether future migraines are less painful um, once patients start receiving ketamine. So there's some limitations in um, in ketamine for treating migraines. However, uh, small doses of ketamine is very effective and it typically reduces the pain associated with the migraine by 50% or greater in most of the studies that have been done. Chronic regional pain syndrome. Besides anesthesia implications, ketamine for CRPS is probably the most studied use of ketamine. The dose, the length, the frequency of the infusions vary greatly from study to study. Some use high doses in an inpatient setting, in an ICU setting, uh, sometimes over multiple, multiple days of continuous uh, ketamine infusions. And then some studies have looked at outpatient doses, that's low and slow as well. And, um, but however, the majority of the studies have all shown significant reduction in the pain scores for up to 10 days post-infusion. So besides depression, um, Chronic regional pain syndrome is probably the, the second most common um, off-label use of ketamine. In looking at CRPS, the um, 
Six studies focus exclusively on the use of ketamine infusions for CR CRPS. The majority of these articles report a pain relief of several weeks after an infusion of an inpatient setting of four to five days of an infusion left. However, uh, some studies have started looking at outpatient infusion protocols requiring multiple serial infusions, similar to what we're seeing in treatment resist resistant depression infusions. And they also reported pain release relief lasting several months in some cases. So it was these early studies of outpatient lower dose ketamine um, infusions that really opened the door for outpatient centers to start looking at can ketamine be administered for these, um, these, these chronic pain syndromes and can it be effective. So fibromyalgia has been a bit more of a hit or miss with ketamine. In general, um, all the data from the studies would basically be considered inconclusive. In other words, some patients have benefits, but a lot of patients are not receiving benefits from ketamine infusion. So um, fibromyalgia is something where it's, it's okay to try it on patients. However, the, um, the results may vary much more drastically than, than depression or chronic pain syndromes. So here's looking at some meta-analysis. These are some of the early studies. We're gonna go through some of them, highlighted a couple of them that we'll talk about that's really influenced the ketamine infusion center market and that's existing today and that's growing today. So the first column is the references. These are the individual study names. The second column is the clinical indication for ketamine. We'll see this page is all CRPS. Uh, the third column is the study size, so all relatively small, 60 subjects, 19 subjects, and 9 subjects. <clears throat> and then the duration of the infusion and whether the study was an inpatient or outpatient, the doses that were given, and then whether or not they were effective or not. If you see the first study that's listed, it was a 100-hour continuous infusion at an inpatient setting with 22.2 milligrams uh, per hour that was normalized to a 70-kilogram patient. So the second study on this page is Schwartzman. Schwartzman was the first study to look at outpatient ketamine infusions uh, for chronic regional pain syndrome, and it showed a really great effectiveness. It was only 19 patients. However, the infusions were four-hour infusions long uh, for a total of 100 milligrams over the four hours. So still low dose. Um, that's a very safe level of infusions. But the concern when he started these studies were is that all the patients before this and all the studies before this were all inpatient. So he was kind of the first outpatient. He was somewhat conservative, wanted to make sure that one, uh, the patients were safe, and two, that there was a that he could show that this low dose and slow infusion still provided the same effectiveness uh, and efficacy in treating pain as did the inpatient infusions that lasted oftentimes for several days. And he did. So 100 milligrams over four hours um, was shown to have a decrease in the sensory and effective components of pain at up to 12 weeks post-infusion. So this was kind of the first initial study that said, hey, this can be done in an outpatient environment, it can be done safely, and it can be effective as well. In this page, these are all also CRPS um, studies that looked at infusions for, for pain. Most of these were, these were all inpatients. Most of them were five-day infusions or as long as the patient tolerated. And these were also very, very effective in treating pain uh, with ketamine. On this slide, we start to see that some of the clinical, in, clinical indications uh, for the pain treatment started changing. Again, this is a meta-analysis. The references um, will be in the rear for you. Um, of this lecture, you'll be able to go and review these yourself if you like. However, the one I highlighted at the bottom from Kim et al. Uh, looked at uh, PHN, um, peripheral hepatic neuropathy pain, and what the reason why Kim is an interesting study is they randomized patients into two groups, ketamine group and magnesium group. And what they found was that both groups had very uh, similar results in decreasing their, um, their perception of pain for a length of time after the infusions. So what this study did, and what many infusion centers, including ours does, is we now started adding magnesium into the ketamine infusions as well for pain patients. The thought process was is that it's, um, it's relatively benign, 
And if it's shown to help with pain, um, why not add it and give our patients the greatest success uh, or the greatest potential of success for relieving their pain for as long as possible as well. So with that, we add, we do, we dose our ketamine. I'll get into our dosage regimen, uh, but we started adding um, two grams of magnesium to every bag of, of ketamine infusion as well. And also 200 milligrams of lidocaine to our two hour uh, ketamine infusions as well, since lidocaine has been shown to be effective. So we give uh, all of the above. On this slide, we'll see some of the fibromyalgia studies. We see that some of the, um, results, as I said, are, are somewhat um, hit or miss from fibromyalgia. If we look at Graven, we see that there was no change um, in any of the pain scores related to um, fibromyalgia post-ketamine infusion. Some of the other studies that are looking at ketamine um, for pain is cancer-induced pain um, and cancer pain that's been refractory to opioids. Ketamine, since it is an anesthetic drug, there's oftentimes uh, state regulations on who can administer ketamine, who can monitor patients receiving ketamine. Uh, some states are starting to change some of their statutes, and they're putting in there certain um, exceptions to the statutes for palliative care. In other words, they're allowing hospice nurses to be able to administer ketamine <clears throat> to cancer patients to, to help with um, some of the palliative care pain that, that those patients are experiencing. I think that's a great idea. Um, I have a personal story related to, to cancer-induced pain and, and palliative pain as well. So the state that I practice in is in Louisiana. And in Louisiana, ketamine can only be administered by uh, CRNAs or a physician. Nurses are not allowed to administer ketamine in Louisiana because it's considered an anesthetic drug and we have a statutory prohibition for anyone other than CRNAs or physicians for administering anesthetic drugs. <clears throat> if the FDA were to change the label of ketamine and to start allow its use um, and label it as not just an anesthetic but as another class of drug as well, then uh, nurses could potentially start administering ketamine in Louisiana without a CRNA actually doing the administration. Um, my story is related to a dear friend of mine. Um, his wife um, was suffering from a rare cancer. She was on hospice and was nearing the end of her life. And I was flying back from Boston from an AANA meeting. And when I landed, I had a bunch of missed calls and messages from him that you know, the hospice care was there. She really has about 24 hours left to live, but she's agitated, uncomfortable, on a morphine drip, uh, 40 milligrams an hour through her metaport. Nothing is touching her. She's just very agitated and very uncomfortable. Would I be willing to talk to the hospice physician and potentially come and administer ketamine to her? I said, absolutely. So uh, she was at home. She was being treated at home. Went straight from the airport to their house. Uh, actually, I stopped over at, at the ketamine clinic and uh, called our ketamine nurse and got some equipment and some supplies, <clears throat> talked it over, uh, visited with the hospice physician, and then went and started administering very, very, very low dose of ketamine to her. Uh, the first dose was um, under 20 milligrams, and the results were immediate and profound. Um, she was tachypnic, breathing over 60 times a minute, um, she was on high flow oxygen, uh, satting in the mid 80s uh, due to the, the cancer in her lungs. After just slightly under 20 milligrams, she had an audible sigh, <sighs> relaxed, breathing slowed down to maybe closer to 30 times a minute, which was still pretty tachypnic, but was much more comfortable. She opened her eyes, looked around the room. Um, and it was an amazing um, experiment, experience. Her SATs went from mid 80s to 96 to 98% just after about 18 to 20 milligrams of, of ketamine being administered. Um, her family was allowed to kind of come back in and spend some time with her because she was much less agitated. She was more uh, coherent, just looked much more comfortable. And over the next day, um, repeated dosages uh, to kind of keep her comfortable and in that state, very low dose um, until she ended up expiring the next day. But it was uh, an amazing experience to be able to be there and to help them in that environment where no other medication would, would help her. 
nothing would touch her pain, high dose opioids, um, receiving benzodiazepines, uh, nothing else helped when just a touch of ketamine was all it took to make her comfortable uh, and much more relaxed. So we're a bit of an advocate for one, getting ketamine, potentially having the FDA change its labeling from just an anesthetic <clears throat> to also another uh, form of drug as well, but also in getting states to allow uh, palliative use of ketamine. It's, it's so safe, it's so effective that this is something that um, really just benefits people. So touching story, I was honored to be a part of it. Um, and it just goes to show how effective and, and how important ketamine is. In looking at other studies for mixed pain, um, Kang came out with 103 um, individuals that were studied. They had two hour infusions for three sessions every other day. The dose was a small dolus, bolus of 0.2 milligrams per kilogram and then half of a milligram per kilogram of ketamine administered over the uh, two hour infusion. These patients saw um, a decreased pain score from their baseline for uh, up to two weeks after their initial treatment. The reason why uh, Kang is highlighted is we dose very similar for our initial dosing um, based off of this study. We're slightly more aggressive now and we'll get into our protocols here. In a moment. And this case is just kind of rounding out the meta-analysis of ketamine via, via outpatient and inpatient regimens for, for treating pain. So, ketamine infusion centers. This is kind of what we all came to, to hear about today. Um, most infusion centers are either owned by mental health specialists, such as psychiatrists, or by anesthesia professionals, either CRNAs or physician anesthesiologists. When we started about three and a half years ago, uh, when I started founding my ketamine infusion center, there were not very many. There were a couple on the East Coast, a couple on the West Coast, and a handful here or there. I heard of a family friend who was flying to Atlanta to get ketamine infusion center, uh, to get ketamine infusions for treatment resistant depression and how it changed her life. And my, immediately I became inquisitive, started learning more about ketamine for depression and ketamine for pain. I said, hey, I think we can do this. So um, founded the ketamine infusion center and Euromin infusion center where, where we have today. And, um, it was so new. A lot of the studies were just coming out. We were very cautious. Um, it was experimental use. There was a lot of uh, potential backlash. Our state board of medical examiners uh, in our state had issued a warning to physicians about administering ketamine for off-label use that they could potentially lose their license if they do so. Uh, that warning was out there. It was in the public. Uh, physicians referring to us was a bit of a problem because it was so new. Everyone was scared of it. Um, so we really built some, some pretty tight protocols, uh, policies and procedures to make sure that we were very safe, that we wouldn't have any adverse events. Uh, we protected ourselves as much as possible. Now, um, there's probably 20 new ketamine centers opening up every year in the United States. So for the past three years, that's a, there's a lot of ketamine clinics now. <clears throat> Most major metropolitan areas have between three and five ketamine clinics um, in each metropolitan area. Ketamine clinics can be a standalone center or it can be a combination um, office with a physician office practice as well. The average square feet that you need for a ketamine center will be around 2,000, depending on the number of infusion rooms uh, that you're going to have and depending on the size of your waiting room and, and any offices that you need to interview patients as well. Ideally, you need a consultation room to be able to privately uh, interview patients prior to starting their infusions. You need a waiting room for family and two to four infusion rooms, typically. The waiting room for family, it's about 50-50 of what we're seeing. A uh, family member being present with the patient during the infusion versus the family member wanting to be out or the patient wanting the family member to be out in the waiting room and not be in the room with them. It really depends on the relationship um, that exists. And, and sometimes it's a spouse that brings in our clients. Sometimes it's a, a son that's bringing a, a father or a mother. Um, sometimes it's a neighbor, right? So it really all depends. We do allow um, one family member to be in the patient uh, room during the infusion if they desire them to be to do so. Uh, we recommend that they 
maintain um, a very quiet environment, a very relaxed environment <clears throat> during the infusion so that the patients don't become agitated or, or have any issues there. In general, the infusions are very, very well tolerated by our patients at the doses that we're giving. Uh, we'll get into those dosages here in a second. Um, on the previous slide, I mentioned two to four infusion rooms. Typically, um, at our center and the doses that we're giving, we do not stay in the room the entire time with the patient. We have a monitor where the patients are on monitoring where we can see the monitors um, and we can make sure that they're comfortable and we can see the patient, but we do not sit in the room with them the entire time. So we can have two, three, or we, we have three infusion rooms set up currently. We can have up to three infusions going at the same time. Typically that gets a little bit busy though with starting the IV, getting the patient going, mixing up the ketamine. Um, we rarely have more than two at our infusion center at one time. Uh, the third room sometimes will be used as a Sporvato room. Sporvato is the intranasal ketamine. Um, patients cannot, um, pay, Sporvato has to be administered at an infusion center that is qualified and certified through a REMS um, questionnaire that's approved by the, um, by the FDA and Janssen. And so the administration of it, even though it's intranasal and it's self-administered by the patient, must be in an approved center and they must be monitored for an approved period of time uh, after the um, inhalation of the Spravato, which is typically two hours. So <clears throat> if you do do Spravato, you'll tie up a room for typically two hours for each uh, intranasal administration. The rooms also have to be private according to the FDA uh, rooms at, um, as well. So since most freestanding centers are set up um, as a physician's office extension, that's what we are. Um, we have a physician medical director and we're set up as an extension of this primary office. Uh, you have to have a DEA number in order to order the drugs in order to get many of the supplies as well. Uh, you need protocols on handling the scheduled drugs <clears throat> that have to meet FDA compliance as well. Security is a bit of a concern. So I don't know if you noticed, but when I mentioned the name of our company, it's called NeuroMend, M-E-N-D, Infusion Center. It doesn't say ketamine in the name of our um, infusion center. We did that on purpose. We were concerned that if we had ketamine um, in on the sign or neon lights over the door that we may attract um, potential issues, uh, one for drug seekers, but also um, some veterinary clinics have um, been burglarized for individuals trying to steal ketamine from, ket uh, from veterinary clinics. We didn't want to attract that kind of attention to us. <clears throat> what we also did on our building is we installed cameras that record our front entrance, our rear entrance, and uh, also on the ketamine mixing area where we keep our, um, our drug box where the ketamine is locked behind two separate locks, we keep a camera on that at all times as well too. Uh, the last thing we wanted was to, um, you know, to be burglarized, have the, have the drug stolen, and then having, um, having that get in the news and also having patients potentially uh, get sick uh, from ketamine administration and the not patients, I guess, but the public. Um, self-administering ketamine and potentially having adverse effects, due to, adverse effects due to our drugs. So we were very conscious of trying to be as safe and secure as possible with our ketamine. The AANA has a ketamine clinic checklist. It was is very, very well done. Below is the link that you can go and review it. I have it um, copied and pasted on some of the slides. We'll talk through some of the um, some of the things that are in it that are really important, but it's very, very well done. It's things to consider if you're going to open a ketamine clinic. So what are our protocols? So we'll start with chronic pain protocol. Our total dose for chronic pain patients are 1.2 milligrams per kilogram, and that's our initial dose. We run that 1.2 milligrams per kilogram over two hours. So the initial dose is 0.6 milligrams per kilogram per hour over two hours. We typically pre-treat with um, one or two milligrams of Versed before the infusion starts or right when it starts, and sometimes another milligram of Versed after the first hour to make sure they remain comfortable and relaxed during the infusion. We assess the patient's pain score before each infusion, after each infusion, and then we call them and assess it weekly for the first month and then monthly for the first year. 
so that we're monitoring what their baseline pain is before their infusions, after their infusions, and then long-term after their infusions as well. I mentioned that the 1.2 milligram per kilogram total dose is our initial dose. We typically go up. Um, these infusions are done. We recommend uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then the following week of Monday, Wednesday, Friday as well. So six infusions over two weeks. We start tapering up the dose from this 1.2 milligram per kilogram that we, start, um, that we start with based on the patient's response, based on how well they tolerate the infusions. And we try and get somewhere near a max dose of two milligrams per kilogram over two hours. So one milligram per kilogram an hour. With the Versed administration, this is usually well tolerated. Patients are relaxed in the chair. Sometimes they'll doze on and off during the infusion, um, sat, stay, whatever their baseline is. Uh, blood pressure and heart rate tend to creep up a little bit, sometimes 10 to 20% higher than their baseline. We keep levetalol and hydralazine on hand to, um, to help just in case the blood pressure gets a little too high, which we administer as needed. This is a life cycle of our pain patients. Um, it's kind of a lot on this slide. In general, um, whether the patient is a self-referral or they're referred from a clinic, uh, we always get their, their records and we view their records and make sure that their diagnosis supports what we're going to be doing for them. Since so technically we're not diagnosing these patients, we're using the diagnosis uh, from their primary care provider and for depression from their primary mental health provider. And we do an analysis to make sure that the patient, one, qualifies, um, two, that this is something that we think we can help them with, and three, that, um, that it can safely be administered in the outpatient uh, environment. So we look at risk factors as well. Then the patient comes in uh, and we start their infusions. We do the first three infusions, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then uh, the second week as well, if needed. Typically, even if the patients get a pretty good relief after the first three infusions over the first week, we really encourage them to come back in to get the following three infusions the next week, even if they're, they're feeling much better, because the thought process is, is that the six infusions will prolong the effectiveness of the ketamine infusion. So it'll last longer if they go through all the six. And we're seeing that anecdotally for depression and pain as well. So here's how we mix the ketamine spot protocol. We typically use 100 mil or 250 mil bags. Uh, we keep it pretty simple. We usually mix it in one-to-one -one ratio. So every one uh, cc is one milligram of ketamine. Um, and then we set the infusion rate as needed based on their weight. So our protocols for depression are a good bit different. The doses are, are much lower and the infusion time starts at one hour instead of two hours. Our, our initial dose for depression patients is 0.5 milligrams per kilogram over the one hour. So it's less than half of the pain doses uh, where the pain patients start. Uh, again, we taper this dose up as well. We usually start maxing out our depression doses, uh, usually slightly less than one milligram per kilogram. We do not typically pre-treat with Versed. There's been some small studies that have shown that benzodiazepines may actually decrease the antidepressant effects of ketamine. So we try to avoid the Versed whenever possible with these ketamine infusions. At these low doses, I'm trying to think, we've had out of hundreds and hundreds of uh, patients, we've only had one or two that have had a bit of a difficult time tolerating the ketamine and needed Versed to help them get through the infusions. So it's very, very uncommon to have to use Versed for depression patients. We monitor these patients before they start their infusions. They're administered uh, the Hamilton depression test. We use the intermediate or moderate version. There's a short version, an intermediate version, and a long version. We use the intermediate version. It gives us a score, and the score, uh, based on how they answer the questions, uh, ties to how depressed they are uh, from a baseline standpoint or when the, before we start the infusions. We also monitor it after, um, either the first three or the first six infusions, depending on how the patients are feeling, and then every week for the first month and then every month for the first year. So we can see patients that are coming in that are showing numbers that are, that are correlating to severe depression. And after a month after their first six infusions, <clears throat> their, their numbers from the Hamilton depression scale typically are pretty much at normal non-depressed levels. So. Um, and we're seeing those types of results in greater than 
of all of our depression patients. So we're seeing a, um, a very high degree of success in patients. And the depression patients that are coming to us all essentially have TRD, treatment resistant depression. They've all tried multiple modalities before coming to us. Some of the side effects that we're seeing, I think the most common thing that we see uh, with these low doses and with no Versed administration is the patients report back that one, um, their brain seems like much more open and their, their thoughts are much more like stream of consciousness where a lot of thoughts are flowing in and out. Um, and two, sometimes they, they mention that sometimes they feel lighter than normal and almost that they're floating above the infusion chair maybe one or two feet above the infusion chair, and they're kind of looking down on the room, the infusion room that they're in. In order to uh, counteract that, since that's probably the most common effect that we, uh, we hear, we have weighted blankets. They weigh 15 or 20 pounds. Uh, patients love them. When we put a weighted blanket on an infusion, they feel secure, they feel grounded to the chair. Um, it really helps to enhance their experience. We monitor blood pressure and pulse ox throughout the infusion. The blood pressure set on every 10 minute cycle. Uh, the pulse ox is continuously monitoring. The, um, we don't use EKG pads. The, trying to decrease the number of wires that the patients have that they fidget with and can make them uncomfortable during the infusion. So we, we do not monitor continuous EKG or ECG. Our infusion center is set up almost like a spa. It's a very relaxing environment. It's comfortable. We have relaxing music playing, uh, which is another thing. Most patients uh, will bring in headphones, noise canceling headphones over the year, sometimes just earbuds, and they listen to some of their most favorite relaxing music during the infusions. They find that that really helps as well too. One, if there's any exterior noise, sometimes it could be distracting for them if they're hearing other noise in the office or the clinic or whether it be road noise or what else. Um, but also it really enhances the experience for them to listen to relaxing music. And I'd say probably 90% of our patients um, will bring in headphones and listen to music. Uh, sometimes they forget. So we do have over the year headphones um, that are Bluetooth that they can use as well. Again, life cycle of a TRD patient. I don't think we need to go into this um, in any detail. Uh, we talk about being charged here a $150 scheduling and initial assessment fee. We have removed that. We found that patients were um, hesitant to sometimes um, pay that fee. Just since these patients are paying cash out of pocket, we struggle to keep our prices as low as possible to be able to help the uh, most number of people possible. Out of the phone calls we get for patients that are interested in, in receiving ketamine, whether it be for depression or pain, um, the number one factor for them not matriculating or coming in and getting their first infusion and matriculating all the way through is usually cost. So we're very cost conscious to make sure that we're charging as little as possible to still be able to uh, support our mission, which is uh, to keep the doors open and help as many patients as possible. The, um, some insurance companies will reimburse patients, some won't. It's kind of hit or miss. <clears throat> Again, um, patients can be self-referred or they can be referred by their mental health expert. And it really just kind of depends. When we first started, uh, probably 70% of our patients were referred to us from mental health experts. That was part of our uh, marketing program to let them understand, let these mental health uh, providers know that we're in the area of what we do, how ketamine works, and um, that was the majority of our patients. And, and obviously, as a new business, we started off pretty slow. It wasn't, we, we, um, we weren't treating tons of patients every day. <clears throat> it was kind of a slow growth. But what we saw over time is more and more patients started self-referring. Patients are looking on the internet, trying to find solutions to um, to the depression that's affecting their life. They start learning about ketamine. They Google uh, for ketamine clinics that are near them, and then they'll self-refer. Once they self-refer, we get the name and we contact back, uh, and we get their permission to contact a mental health expert to get all their records over sent to us so that we have records um, you know, with their diagnosis and supporting what, uh, that they do qualify for, for ketamine infusions with us. This is the um, kind of our infusion log sheet, sheet vital sign log sheet. We haven't gone to electronic records at this point. We're still keeping them on paper. We do have electronic scheduling and a couple of other um, electronic components. 
but for the monitoring of the patient during the infusion, uh, this is still the sheet that we use. Uh, we start with the baseline vital signs, who started the infusion, uh, where we are in Louisiana, that always has to be a CRNA. Um, any allergies and any pertinent history as well. And then uh, every 10 minute vital sign check and a verbal response. We always check in on the patients and get a verbal response from them. In other words, yes, I'm doing fine. Or if they report back, no, I'm not feeling well, something's not right, then we can stop the infusion and talk to them. Uh, a lot of times what we tell patients is, is when we poke our, you know, our head in and, and ask them how you're doing, if everything's fine, they can just smile and give us a thumbs up, right? They don't, they don't have to talk to us and <clears throat> we're not doing any, any deep psychoanalysis during the infusion. They're just really in a relaxed state, um, hopefully enjoying some of the um, stream of consciousness thoughts that come in. We do a little bit of talking to them about whether it be guided meditation or um, or how to somewhat control their thoughts during the infusion. Since it is an open door, we encourage them that when negative thoughts coming in, we don't want them to perseverate on it. We want them to recognize those thoughts coming in, taking a deep breath, and visually seeing those thoughts leaving their head, and then focusing on something that's more positive and more happy. Um, we found that really helps patients tolerate the infusions a lot better as well. And setting expectations is really important for, for how, how well our clients tolerate their infusion. We spend a lot of time talking to them about what to expect. Um, and it, it, we've gotten much better at our communication standpoint with our nurse um, who's with the patients. He's, he is studying for his, um, his psych NP. He's been a nurse for about 10 years and he's amazing with patients. It really makes them feel more comfortable, which helps the entire experience and helps the end results as well. So here's the ANA checklist that I mentioned earlier. We're gonna go through this pretty quickly and we're gonna wrap up here. Um, I'm available. Um, I think my email is, is pretty widely uh, distributed or you can Google my name if you have questions in the future, you can always reach out to me. Um, however, we're gonna look at some of the considerations from the ANA checklist. Hopefully this will show you screen. There's a link to it several slides earlier or you can just log into your ANA credentials and, and pull this up. So the first thing you really need to do is understand your state uh, scope of practice issues and whether or not you're gonna be in violation of any scope of practice issues within your state or whether or not you're gonna be compliant. A lot of times the first source for getting that information besides knowing your Nurse Practice Act and any rules and regulations in your state is to contact your local state uh, AANA organization and ask them. Uh, I, I say that's the first step because I've heard stories of providers going out to their state boards of nursing and asking them first hey, I want to open a ketamine clinic and treat, you know, depression patients and pain patients with ketamine. Well, state boards of nursing aren't that well educated on what ketamine is, some of these off-label uses, um, whether or not you're going to be doing the diagnosing or whether or not you won't be diagnosing. <clears throat> and they don't spend a lot of time and energy sometimes in the response, and the response a lot of times is, um, you're not qualified, you're not trained to treat mental health disorders. So no, you can't open a ketamine clinic. So I caution that and make sure that you talk to your state association of nurse anesthetists first, because maybe they can, if you do need to go to the state board of nursing, maybe they can help you craft the question better because the, um, the way we look at it is in, in administering ketamine, let's say for treatment resistant depression, you are not diagnosing depression, you're not treating depression, you're administering a modality that treats the depression. In other words, if you are administering anesthesia for a colonoscopy, you're just given the propofol so the colonoscopy can happen. You're not the one actually doing the colonoscopy. So um, we get referrals from mental health experts. We have medical directors that sign off on protocols and sign the orders for, for the ketamine and the doses that we're giving. Um, to kind of protect us from that. So we're just administering the drug, which is an anesthetic drug that we know more about than any other specialty. So that's why we think um, outpatient ketamine should be run or should have a CRNA involved in them as well. So after that, you need to look at uh, employment agreements. ANA has a lot of great resources for starting your own business, uh, independent contractor checklist, CRNA employment checklist. 
um, anesthesia services checklist. These are really, really good documents that you can pull from to help make sure that you're not missing anything. From a malpractice standpoint as well, you need to be careful. Ketamine uh, is off-label use. Uh, it is still considered experimental in these uh, treatments that we've been talking about today. So make sure your malpractice carrier covers you for that. And if they don't, uh, maybe reach out to some others and make sure that you are covered from a malpractice standpoint. So some of the considerations on the clinic, uh, some of the infrastructure, you really need to do a market analysis, know the demographics in your area, are there any other competitive or competitors or other ketamine clinics? How busy are they? Are they, um, are they over capacity and can't take any more patients? Then maybe your services are needed. Um, if they're not very busy and just kind of limping along, you probably don't need a second ketamine clinic in your market. Uh, from my experience, you need a patient population that has a fair amount of disposable income since the majority of your patients will be cash pay patients. It's hard to support the mission when you can't generate enough money to, to pay your overhead and to keep the doors open. So <clears throat> I caution anyone for getting into this business strictly for, uh, for financial reasons. It is risky. You're, you know, you're having to get a building or sign a lease on a building. You're hiring staff. You're buying equipment, supplies. Uh, you're putting money out there um, and you're risking that money for a potential return. However, um, my caution would be if you're doing this strictly for financial reasons, you probably would be better off just picking up extra shifts as a CRNA. And that money is guaranteed. There's no risk involved with it. You're not investing your capital. Um, you can take that money and invest it. Where in this case, there's no guarantee of success. It's starting a business. Every business is a risk. And uh, to be frank, the vast majority of businesses in America fail during the first 18 months, usually because they run out of money. So make sure you know your demographics, make sure you have a large enough population um, and that they have a decent enough disposable income to be able to pay cash for your services and then determining what you should charge for your services as well is important. Also, look at referrals. Um, where are your patients be coming from? I talked about referrals from mental health experts, pain management physicians, and then self-referrals. Self-referrals now make up probably the majority of most ketamine clinic businesses. Patients are finding this on their own. They're seeking out the help on their own. So you have to make sure you have an online presence uh, from Google searches to blogs to different types of advertising as well. So marketing is important if you're gonna start a ketamine infusion center. After that, you need to figure out what type of personnel are you gonna have in the clinic? Uh, you're going to have a nurse with you. You have two nurses. You need a receptionist. Who's going to help you run the day-to-day -day business of the ketamine clinic? It's very difficult for the individual CRNA to handle everything involved in treating patients and setting up, you know, taking care of the infusions, answering the phone, scheduling important you know, um, follow-up visits and scheduling um, appointments for the future. So you need some help. You need some staff. Um, Will you be credentialing? Are you gonna have a credentialing agency for your, for your facility? You do not require to have any type of accreditation or credentialing um, at a ketamine center if it's listed or um, incorporated as a physician's office extension. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> right now, that's a bit of a problem because there's ketamine clinics that are doing, we talked about our protocols and what we give um, our patients I would say we're probably on the conservative side. I hear stories of patients getting massive doses of ketamine in outpatient centers. Uh, there's no one regulating this. There's no, um, there's no set guidelines for exactly what should or should not be given. So it's a bit scary that there's no accreditation agency and there's no real guidelines. The concern is if one or two bad outcomes happen, then um, maybe the entire industry could get kind of a black eye. So keep that in mind, but we are very um, conservative and cautious in our uh, ketamine clinics. Where you're gonna put your clinic is very important. Uh, what type of equipment you're gonna have. I've mentioned that we do blood pressure, pulse oximetry only. We have a monitor in every room. We have comfortable infusion chairs in every room, very comfortable waiting room for um, patient family members and a nice uh, office where patients can come in and get interviewed and, and have private conversations as well. You probably need a crash cart. We have a, um, a rolling 
um, small crash cart that's used for offices with an AED on it. We do not have a defibrillator, we have an AED, but our crash cart comes with um, all the intubation equipment, all of the drugs, and um, everything that you would need in an emergency. The company we bought it from offers a service that as the drugs start to expire, they'll send you an email and with a single click, they can replace those drugs. First started having some drugs expire, no big deal. Atropine needed to be replaced. My nurse clicked on it, <clears throat> a new vial of atropine or two showed up and we replaced it in our crash cart. What we didn't notice uh, was that we were invoiced about $60 for each at atropine um, that was sent over to us. And I think the cost at our local pharmacy for the same atropine was about $4. So keep that in mind. It was convenient, but it's very expensive. So now when our drugs are starting to expire, we go ahead and order it locally uh, from our local pharmacy. So patient eligibility, your consultations, how will you screen patients? Um, is just ASA 1 and 2 okay? Or will you do 3 and 4 for physical status patients as well in your clinic? Uh, what precautions are you taking with those individuals as well? Then documentation. I, sh I showed you our vital sign sheet. We also have a questionnaire that patients answer um, based on for a health history questionnaire. We put that in as well with all their medical records from their, their primary care provider as well. Treatment and management. Um, ketamine treatment is not a first-line treatment for pretty much any of the modalities that we discussed. It really is kind of uh, after everything else has failed before you should typically try ketamine for most of these patients. Um, you need to do a history and physical, make sure that um, they have either medical clearance or you clear them medically based on the history and physical that you do. Uh, conduct an anesthesia assessment as well. NPO status is something that it's variable, right? So our patients, especially for depression patients, they're maintaining their own airway, they're staying 100% awake. We re request them to stay NPO for their first infusion, just to make sure we'll see if they have a, a bit of a propensity for nausea and vomiting. If they don't, we do typically let them have a light meal four hours before, uh, before coming in. They're maintaining their own airway, they're awake, they're communicating with you. Um, we typically allow that, but that's up to you and your individual discretion. The monitoring I talked about, uh, vital signs, heart rate, blood pressure, um, oxygen saturation. We monitor their level of consciousness through verbal communication every 10 minutes. Uh, we are not doing entitled CO2 monitoring and we're not doing uh, continuous ECG monitoring as well. Uh, established processes for how do you manage side effects, whether you stop the infusion, administer uh, Versed or some other agent, how do you treat that if side effects do become too big of an issue? One of the other side effects we mentioned earlier is blood pressure. It's not uncommon to see up to 20% increase in blood pressure. So if their baseline is already high, you need to understand that you may possibly be treating blood pressure occasionally. We've had numerous patients that we've had to send to primary care to get their blood pressure under control um, from that, that's coming in for infusions with really high baseline pressures. And then recovery criteria, how long, how long will they be monitored? How will you monitor them? Uh, who will you send them home with? Uh, can they go home with Uber? Can they go home with just family members and caregivers? Those are all decisions that you'll, you'll have to make as a business owner. Uh, Follow-up treatment and communication. We stay in contact with our patients monthly uh, just to make sure that everything's fine, make sure they don't need anything else. Um, we, we, by checking up on them, uh, we can know whether or not how long the infusions are lasting, which is a good feedback tool for us. We administer the Hamilton Depression Scale monthly so we can see and we can chart patients' recovery. They start here, start feeling better, and how long they stay feeling better before they start trending back down as well. Drug disposal and diversion. I mentioned we have cameras. We have a log sheet that, every, um, that we have to log out the ketamine every time we use it. Uh, it's locked in an F, um, FDA approved cabinet with two locks inside of another cabinet that's locked on the outside as well. Um, and we're always, you know, counting and making sure that um, nothing is happening to our drugs because we do have scheduled drugs. Reimbursement. Ketamine is not typically paid by insurance companies. Uh, Spervato typically is. You can get approval for that. I'm going to be honest, we're seeing a lot better effectiveness with IV ketamine than we are seeing with intranasal spirato. That's something anecdotal. Uh, you can read the research. You can determine for yourself um, what do you think about that. But we've had numerous patients that have went off, that had IV ketamine, started feeling better, 
transitioned to Sporvato and over a period of time started feeling depressed again and Sporvato was not working and came back for booster IV infusion. So <clears throat> take that as you will, it's anecdotal, but it's what we're seeing. Um, establish your fee schedule. Uh, it needs to be something that can support your mission to keep the doors open, uh, but also be able to help the most patients possible. That's the way I look at it. Um, if you need billing staff, you know, make sure you have someone that can, can help with billing. For ketamine IV infusion patients, we provide most patients with a super bill. They can go after they pay us cash, submit that super bill to their carrier, and maybe get a partial or sometimes full reimbursement for what they paid out of pocket. But that's carrier dependent. We're not involved in that process other than giving them a super bill of exactly what we did, what we administered, and what our costs were. So future of ketamine, a lot of off-label uses are studied. Um, I think this is going to continue. Ketamine is such a unique drug that it re reacts on so many different types of neurotransmitters and, and biochemicals and has so many reactions associated with it. Who knows where, um, where ketamine will go. We talked about S-ketamine, which is Parvato. Uh, that was approved in 2019. It requires a REM certification uh, for storage and monitoring of patients as well. I believe there's going to be a post-test. We'll try and function this so you can get a little bit of pharmacology CEUs as well, if possible, as well as the uh, one-hour CEU, CEU for attending this uh, virtual session, which has been interesting and unique, I must add. I am a walker. Um, when I am speaking, I tend to walk around the audience and talk, and I love feedback. Questions from um, attendees is kind of the one of the most gratifying and um, important parts of, of kind of speaking with individuals because it, you can tailor the conversation to exactly what interests them a little bit more. So in this case, no questions are, are possible since it's virtual. So it's been a little bit different and I've had to sit in a chair, which is not my normal uh, comfortable way of speaking. So hopefully it was enjoyable. Hopefully you uh, picked up some tidbits on ketamine. And um, if you have further interest, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you.